So I would pass uh, the floor to Mr. Ashford to uh, raise his ideas about uh, uh, the regulation indu induced innovation for sustainable development and other important issues. Uh, let me say, uh, let me ask all of you not to leave your institutional affiliation outside, but to leave your disciplinary uh, affiliation outside. Because I'm going to make a case that both the regulatory agencies and the affected publics have concentrated almost to the exclusion of anything else on science rather than on the technology which may solve problems that science creates. So for just 15 minutes, if you could leave that interest aside, it would be really marvelous. Let me tell you that I am trained at the PhD level as a chemist. I taught freshman chemistry before I was <coughs> diverted into law and economics. I'm not a technologist, but I'm going to argue that technology is essential and an essential missing element in the whole discussion about what are problems and what are solutions. And particularly the subtitle of my address was the neglect of innovation and technology distorts the decision-making process by the agencies, by the legislature, and indeed by the critics of regulation. And I think this is, has got to be changed, and that's what I meant by asking you to leave your disciplinary uh, focus outside. Next slide, please. Here we have, you can see it's a matrix. It's the way all people, agencies, consumer advocates start with a question. That is, there's a decision to be made about what looks like a problem, and there are a lot of people involved in the problem. There are producers of chemicals and providers of services. There are the workers who work for them, the consumers, and then there are others who may be bystanders um, to the process. And the effects of either the use of a chemical or its restriction will have economic effects, which are suitably discussed in terms of dollars. It will have health and safety effects, which is the province of risk assessment, as well as environmental uh, ecosystem effects. So we have been focusing on this middle column, as we've been focusing on how to get access, transparency of risk assessments, its limitations. But I want to remind you that what decision makers do either explicitly or implicitly is balance the cost against the benefits. Now, how do they do that? Well, the costs are expressed in dollar terms or pound terms or, or euros. The benefits are expressed in lives saved, fatalities prevented, cases of cancer averted. But what the heroic assumption that's made is to put a monetary value, and there's where the economists come in, upon a benefit and to discount it to present value so that things like global climate change which are not going to affect the island states like Indonesia do not occur for 50 years from now. So they don't count very much in terms of today's terms. And I appreciate the earlier comments about economics. Eco economics is far too important to be left to the economists. We know that not only in the context of health and safety regulation, but you just take a look at the, the European financial architecture which is built on a house of sand and the imposition of austerity on nations today, on Greece, which will never, never meet the promise that they have. Never. And the financial architecture of Europe is at the root of the reluctance to spend any money on environment or global climate change. It will not work. It has not worked. It cannot work. And if you notice, the only people who are advocating austerity are not economists but politicians. Any economist who is commenting on this area has been talking about the futility of cutting off all means of advancing a society's productivity by imposing austerity measures. This is a lesson for UK, it's a lesson for Europe, and I urge you to look at, but that's another matter. Nonetheless, e economics is a profession where we know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And this is something to be remembered. Now, <clears throat> the formalism <clears throat> applies a monetary value for every matrix element 
and then looks to see if the benefits exceed the costs. <clears throat> they do that, and the attention then is often paid on simply the risk assessment question, arguments about science. And arguments about science, whether one part per million or five parts per million exposure to benzene is what we ought to have, can consume hours and pages of time with no resolution. No resolution at all. And so I think you ought to look at the futility of where we are putting our, our arguments. Now, this is a graph, which is very important, which talks about innovation. It's, I've, what I've graphed is basically the cost of a technology versus P, the performance. And you can think of it in this way. If you look at the, the leftmost graph near the letter A, <clears throat> which says the current technology, think about the internal combustion engine. You don't need to think about chemicals. The internal combustion engine, you want better and better performance, you want better and better efficiency, it's going to cost you more and more. So there's an upward sloping curve. However, if you get the industry, the center of gravity for the industry to innovate, they will come up with what is called new sustaining technology. What does sustaining mean? It means it's the same model you always had. That is, you have petrol, which has got a spark put to it, which ends up driving a piston. And whether you have fuel injection or a heated manifold or you move from V6 to V8, this is an innovation which modularly, mo basically moves the curve a little bit to the right. But there, there's other kind of innovation which comes out of left field, which is not usually coming from the incumbent, or if it comes from the incumbent industry, it comes from the technological leader. I'm drawing your attention to the fact that we have originally electric cars which weren't very effective, internal combustion engines which reach their limitation, but only Toyota, which has always been an intensive R&D industry, to thought the idea, let's put a small internal combustion engine with a battery, and voila, you have three times the efficiency. And that curve way to the right is called disruptive technology. <clears throat> And disruptive technology can be applied to the control of toxic substances, to the substitution, to the changing of processes. <clears throat> but the thing to understand is that new technology, like, like Tesla, that, an, a company that never made automobiles, almost always the significant new technology comes from without the industry. It is a new entrant. It is not from the incumbent. If we allow the incumbent to impose through cost-benefit or other rationales the agenda, you will not have the Lexus. You will not. And by the way, don't ever believe that the government can't pick winners. Mariana Mazzucotto has done excellent research showing, in fact, the Lexus and the computer and the airlines, all these other things came from government basic investment in science, and may I say, pharmaceutical research, which is done by the NIH and then handed over to the pharmaceutical industry who then claims it did the discovery from beginning to end. So <clears throat> you have to consider the fact that your regulatory signals and your criticisms and your fights have not been about moving the solutions. Now, we, Eric Millstone yesterday talked <clears throat> quite correctly about the inability to separate science, uh, basically, a risk assessment from the technology management, from the risk management process. <clears throat> is the consideration of technology a risk management issue? No, it is a risk assessment issue. Because if you go back to that matrix, what you put in as the costs, if it doesn't reflect the cost of new technology, it is overestimated by a factor of three to five. So. When you balance the cost against the benefits, even if someone forces you to do that, you got to use the right costs and the right benefits. Now, Adam at Harvard, Mr. Porter, the famous Porter hypothesis, talked about the fact that regulation can elicit very kinds of technological responses. It can be end of pipe pollution control, or it can change the inputs, the process, or the product formulation. And the regulated firm has the capacity to come up with rather modest changes to its products. But, and this is the Porter hypothesis, that basically you're going to have that happen. It's above the dotted line. But 
The MIT work, which preceded Porter by 15 years, shows that stringent regulation brings in other producers. For example, I'll give you one, a real example. PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, were the transformer fluid, fluid made by Monsanto. It took Dow Silicone to come in and totally take over the market from Monsanto by coming up with a non-biphenyl product. And it was a great improvement environmentally over the PCBs. Again, no matter how much Monsanto wanted to come up with a substitute, it could not, it did not have the technology to do it. Now this is how it works. If I throw the curve or the other way around here and I say, okay, let's graph the cost versus the extent of risk. So on the horizontal axis is increasing pollution. What this curve says is this is the best technologies to control various amounts of risk. If you have a curve, I'm, I don't know if my previous remarks made any sense about the graphs. Okay. This curve shows you that at various levels of risk, as you decrease towards the horizon, it becomes increasingly expensive to control the hazard. This is what you call the efficient <coughs> frontier. And if you have that a demand for safety, <coughs> good products, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> there is a crossing of the curve, which is the supply of technology. That's with the upward slip, sloping curve I first show you. And the demand, the greater the risk, the greater demand for reduction. The economist will tell you next that the crossover point is what you call the economic efficiency point. This is where you should neither have more regulation nor should you have less regulation. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're given. Yeah, next yeah, slide. Next one. But if you... No. If you put on the curve the cost of new technology, which is much lower and to the left than existing technology, then you notice a couple of things. First of all, instead of spending money using old technology, you can get a lower risk for the same amount of money, which is the one, the, the dot to the left. Next one. Or you could spend more. No. No. Yeah, sure. It's not. It's really. Well, all right, let me just make it very clear. The arrow is pointing to a crossover point which is both lower risk and lower cost. It is called dynamic efficiency. Now, I've told you more about technology than you probably ever want to heard here. This is the takeaway lesson, mm -hmm. that innovation will lower both the cost and the achievable risk huh? mm -hmm. in terms of this issue. Um, now... Uh, next slide. Stringency is stringency. It, if it demands the level of, of compliance that you cannot achieve with existing technology, then innovation is required. And the failure of the regulatory agencies is to demand performance beyond existing capability. Go to the next slide, please. There's a study by OECD that shows that stringent regulation, in fact, improves productivity in the leading firms and lowers productivity in the lower firms. That's exactly what you want. You want to phase out coal-powered power plants. You want to phase out inefficiency industry. You want to phase out PCBs in favor of a better chemical. Next slide, please. Okay, one beyond that. Go ahead. Okay, no, back up. Now, what you see, back up, please. Ah, Good. Here's your matrix that you look at. What you see right away is the cost that you have been given by industry is far too high. And so what is it you can do about this problem? Last slide. Okay. Stop. You can either spend all your time refining risk assessment or arguing about it, or you can look at technology options analysis and say, look, this technology is problematic. Are there other ways of achieving the same social benefit? And whether you decide to push innovation or not depends not only on whether you want to be right or wrong about regulating a hazard, that's a type one, type two problem, error, 
you're committing a type three error, you're working on the wrong problem, if you don't ask the question, what technology could we put into place which is clearly safer? Now when C CFCs were discovered to ruin the ozone layer, you know, <laughs> what happened? Industry replaced the aerosol can with just the pump. No carrier at all. Technology was simple. There are technologies which are either available by the incumbent industry or a replacement industry. Now, let me tell you that what is not happening in Europe and what is happening in California is they're asking for these problematic technologies, what could you be doing to control the technology? And so you demand a certain amount of technological literacy, not just literacy in toxicology and epidemiology. When I asked you, put your discipline aside outside the room, Think about the fact that if all you are arguing about is the level of safe control, then you're not going to win that argument. You're not going to win that argument. If you argue about could you provide the same function to society with a better technological approach, there's much less argument. Maybe a company doesn't want to do it, but there is a company waiting in the wings to take the place of the technologies which have been around for 40 years. We are working, my friends, on the wrong problem. And I say this kindly, and you are my friends, but you have to stop concentrating on arguments about risk. It's not gonna get you anywhere. And you know something? The industry knows it. The American industry wants to continue animal studies as a basis of regulation because it is a, it is a bottleneck to regulation. And the European you know, advance of using structure activity relationships, if they in fact implement it and are not seduced back into talking about risk assessment, <coughs> we'll get them to the same position. You've got to get off this raft and start dealing with research.